Book of Romans chapter 8. The book of Romans, Paul has written it to individuals that he loves, the church there in Rome, the Christians in Rome. He, he's told them he wants to come and see them. But things have happened and situations have arisen and, and uh, he's put it all into God's hand. He'd always tell him whenever the Lord opens the doors, I'll, I want to come. Uh, he has gone to Jerusalem. Prophecies have been made that uh, he was going to be arrested and face a lot of trials and difficulties um, in Jerusalem. So he didn't know the outcome of his trip to Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, so he penned this letter, possibly anticipating not ever making it to Rome. Of course he did, not quite the way he anticipated, but he penned this letter in the mindset and the heart of, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. And so he wanted to make sure that he covered everything. He wanted to make sure that he addressed Christianity and he wanted to make sure that he addressed that, that all of us are sinners and just because we're Christians and we've accepted the Lord does not mean that we're better than anybody else. He penned it with the heart of the new beginning. You're, you're born in Christ. You're, the Bible refers to us as babes in Christ, suggesting that there's got to be a growing time. There's a, a maturing time. Our, our two grandsons are, are three and, and one and a half, and there's a difference. Okay, The one and a half year old doesn't act like the three year old. But to be honest with you, the three year old doesn't act like my 16 year old granddaughter either. And, and so there's, we understand that. There's, you start here and there is a process. And I, and I believe that Paul has penned this letter with that heart as far as there is a growing, there is a process that takes place in Christianity. There isn't just the acceptance of the Lord into our life and into our heart and the cleansing of sins and then we skip off happily ever after. That's a growing process. We begin at that day and then there's a constant growing. He's introduced us in, in chapter eight to life in the spirit. Uh, something that outside of Christ, you people have never experienced a life in the spirit. And, and so it's a new life and it's a different life. But it also he's also warned us and shared with us that this new life in the spirit is attacked and opposed and questioned and challenged by our flesh, by what we've always thought, by uh, the way we were raised, by the way the world is. There's these attacks on Christianity. And so he's, he's addressed it, and he's, he's moving into a phase of, of maturity, if you will. I can remember years ago, I took martial arts. I took Kung Fu San Su, and, and it's interesting to watch the stages. When you first start off and you're a white belt, you feel you learning things and you feel so clumsy. It's like, boy, I hope nobody tries to pick a fight with me because I think I would beat myself up in the process of trying to do any, I don't know what I'm doing. And so you, were, you didn't tell anybody that you were taking martial arts for fear that they would challenge you when you were so inexperienced and, and uneducated. You knew a few things, but then you move into the yellow belt, the next belt, and by then you, you know stuff. You've learned some stuff. And to be honest with you, you tend to walk around like, yeah, bump into me. Yeah, go ahead, bump into me. Yeah, come on, come on. You want a piece of me? And, and you're looking for that fight because now you know something and you want to show everybody what you know. And then you move into a green belt and a brown belt and you have no need to prove anything to anybody. You know what you know. You know what you're capable of. You know what you can do. And so you do your best to avoid things. You do your best to just maintain and, and you know, I don't want to get in a fight. I, I, would, I would walk away from the fight. In fact, my instructor uh, used to teach us a, a true knowledgeable fighter would figure out a way of walking away from. I mean, if he had to, he had to, but he would always figure out and go towards the way of refer or, or walking away from a fight and, and I think this is where Paul has taken us that listen we're now in that mature me, we've gone through that first phase of we've accepted the Lord and we don't know anything so we don't say anything to anybody because we know they'll ask us a question that we can't answer then we'll embarrass ourselves and embarrass the Lord and so we just kind of sit back and we don't say nothing to anybody okay and then we go into the green belt phase into where then we're just we know so much more than everybody else you're going to hell you're going to hell you're going to hell too i'm not 
I'm not because I know Jesus. And we, we become arrogant. And then we come into that, and this is where I believe he has us into that full-on relationship, the depth of Christianity, the depth of being a Christian and what it means to be a Christian. It's not like, hey, hallelujah, I'm saved from my sins, amen, but there's so much more to being a Christian in our relationship with God. He's shared with us in, in the book of, of Romans so far, he says, listen, we're, we're sons and daughters of God. We've been adopted into the family of God. We are heirs of God. Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father, he, he's inherited heaven. We get to also inherit heaven. And so he's begun to introduce to us the wonders and the glory and the excitement and the power and the joy of being a Christian. Sometimes, sometimes, and I don't understand this, and I'm not trying to judge, but sometimes I know of, of, of individual Christians that they get bored and tired of being a Christian. And I, you know, maybe it's just because I've been a pastor for 110 years and I, I just can't imagine being bored. Um, but I, I've, I've known of people who just like, yeah, you know, I've, I walked with the Lord for 10 years and it's, you know, I mean, it's cool. I mean, I'm glad I'm going to heaven. Don't misunderstand me, but don't do much. Don't say much. You know, it's kind of a, and I'm just thinking, what is wrong with you? Paul is addressing and introduced us in chapter eight into the life in the spirit, the spirit of God dwelling within us. What does that mean? What does that do? What does that unfold in our life as, as these attacks are coming against us and the opposition and, and, and the trials and the tribulations and the circumstances and the events that we face? What does this mean to a Christian? What does this ha kind of effect does it have on our lives? In our text today, Paul is, is basically continuing what he said in, in verses 28 through 30 of chapter 8. So I, I want to go back and read that before we jump into our actual text. We covered this last week, but, but today's text is, is continuing that comment. He says in verse 28 of Romans 8, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. As I shared last time, I don't believe Paul's purpose in these ver verses was to make a theological statement. Though he did, that wasn't the basis and that's not what he was making this statement for. I believe that he was bringing or is bringing a conclusion to the statement he made in verse 28. All things work for good to those that are in Christ Jesus. And he's explaining the assurance of God's ability to work all things together for good to those that love God and are called according to God's purpose. So, you know, he's made that statement and he's pointing to the all-knowing ability and power of God. Because when you hear that, all things work for good together for those who love God. Uh, I don't know how that's possible. Check this out. He knows everything. He's all-powerful. That's how I can grab that verse and stand on it and live in it. We need to rest in who God is. We need to rest in, in what God does in our lives. We tend to often question and challenge and even argue and debate and run from what God is doing. And Paul's point is, listen, everything that's going on, everything that God is doing, he's bringing it to good. It's going to end up good for those that love God. But what about this? Well, how come he let that? Well, this ain't good. And, and we find ourselves debating. And, and so he says, listen, he knows everything. He, he's above all. He's all powerful. And so he's pointing to us. He can, he can accomplish verse 28 because he's God. And he's all knowing. 
and he has all the power. And so we need to rest in that, not question it, not challenge it, rest in it. We need to surrender everything to the Lord, and we need to trust our lives into his power and into his love, because he knows what he's doing, folks. He's more than able to complete in us the good work that he's begun in us. Paul is saying, this is the God that I'm asking you to trust. This is the God that I'm asking you to follow. This is the God that I'm asking you to lay your life openly surrendered to him. This is who he is. This is what he's capable of. So with, with all these truths that he's laid out before us, that God who foreknew us has predestined us, to be conformed into the image of Christ. He's called us, he's justified us, he'll glorify us. Paul then begins in our text to then, so this, this brings up some interesting questions. And he asks these questions in our text today. Look at verse 31 of Romans chapter eight. He says, what then shall we say to these things? What things? The things that he's just said, that God has predestined and called and, and justified and glorified. What, what do we say to this? He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Father, as we open your word, we want to grow in you. We want to understand you, Father. Or may this not just be a time of hearing the word. May this be a time of absorbing, grabbing a hold of, embracing, accepting, and longing for more. So bless this time as we open your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. So learning of the power and the abilities of God, what should we say about things? Here, here Paul is strongly encouraging us to think about the truth that he just told us. Don't just go, oh, that's cool. He goes, no, you need to think about it. Ask questions about it. Do you realize what I just said? Do you realize that I said that God works all things out for good? Do you realize that I said that, that you are, he wants to conform you into the image of Christ, that you're predestined and, and that you're called and that you're justified and, and that you're glor- do, do you realize that? Does that bring questions to mind? It should. We should question these things. He brings these questions to our forefront. So knowing that, if God's for you, who can be against you? Think about that. If God is for you, who is all powerful, all knowing, who should intimidate you? Who should scare you? Who should be against you? We have to ask ourselves, we have to be willing to take God's word and I don't wanna just read it and go, huh, I wanna dive into it. I wanna ask questions like this. So if this is all true, and since God is with me, who's against me? Well, there are some things against us. Satan is against us. The world is against us. Jesus writes in John 15, beginning in verse 18, he says, he says if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. So <laughs> there are those that come against us. There is Satan that comes against us. There is the world that comes against us. But the idea that Paul is pointing to, so he, he's already made mention in the previous verses and chapters that we will face opposition, we will face trials and tribulation. But his point here is, listen, since God knows everything and that God is all powerful and that God is working all things together for good to fulfill his purpose, who is Satan to come against us? 
He's nothing. He, he can't defeat. What's the world compared to who God is? Why should we fear? Why should we fear them coming against us? They will. In the Bible, Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome. So, truth be told, yes, we will face persecution. Yes, things and people and Satan and the world will come against us. Okay, but the cool thing is, God's for you. This mindset and heart is why David wasn't afraid to fight Goliath. Is why David ran after Goliath. Everybody else was about to go, and they're out there fighting the war, and here comes the big old giant, boom. Ah, they all ran back to the tents. And, and why were they afraid? Look at him. Look at the size of this guy. Look at the size of his sword. I don't even know if I can pick up his sword. I don't even know if I can pick it. Do you see his spear? And they ran. And yet David, with just a sling and some stones, no no armor, literally ran after the guy. Why? Because he says, yeah, he's big. Yeah, his sword's scary. Yeah, his javelin and spear is massive. But God's on my side. God is for me. God's not for him. Why would I be afraid of Goliath? This is the heart that, that Paul is addressing here. He says, so yeah, you're going to have Goliath come after you. Yeah, you're going to face opposition. Okay, we have a choice. Do I run back to camp like all the army of Israel? Or do I be a David and go, yeah, you're huge, you're scary. But God's for me. He's not for you. So rest in that. Grab a hold of that. Never think that Satan is the opposite of God. A lot of times people think, well, you know, well, you've got God and then you've got Satan who's the opposite of God. Oh, no, he is nowhere near the opposite of God. You can't even put them in the same category. God is the infinite, eternal creator. Satan is a finite, created being. God, he was created. Nobody created God. Satan may be the opposite of Michael the archangel or Gabriel the angel, but never is he the opposite of God. Never think of him as the opposite of God. So though, with, with that in mind, though the forces of hell may gather against us, they're nothing compared with the power of God. And God is for you. He's not against you. They're against you, but... They're a Goliath. Ah! But you have God. You're the David. So you don't have to be afraid is what Paul is saying there. Now how do we know that he's for you and me? Because he didn't spare his own son. He delivered you. Delivered means he gave him. He didn't allow it to happen. Well, whatever happens, happens. He gave, he delivered Jesus up to be crucified for us all. He delivered his own son to die for our sins. He delivered his son to suffer and, and to be despised and rejected. It, it is so hard and painful to see our children go through any pain and suffering. As parents, we, we would gladly take the place of our children and suffer for them. When, when there's just nothing you can do for them and you just... You just watch them moan and hear them moan and, and you see them going through things. You know, it, it, I can remember years ago, our grandson, uh, Joshua, um, fell and, and broke his leg and, and we didn't have insurance and so we, he was staying with us so we took him to the hospital and, and uh, you know, we took him to just a, a general, the gen, not LA, but out in San Bernardino, general hospital and after an hour and a half of sitting there and, and we were nowhere near the time of being called in, I remember scooping him up and saying, I don't care what it costs. And we took him to a hospital and, and, and uh, they, you know, as we pulled up, they, you know, Jeanette went in and said the deal and they come running out with a wheelchair and got him into it and and you know um it was expensive got to be honest with you but you know it was like i'm not going to sit here like this is my grandson and he's hurting and he's in pain and and you know I, i'm not criticizing the hospital they had a whole bunch of people there but as far as i was concerned this was the important one okay he should take priority over everybody else 
that's the love of a parent. It's hard to see our kids go through things. And we would give anything to take it upon ourselves. And yet God delivered up his son. He sent his son and gave us his son to pay for our sins. God's not reluctant to help you and me, you guys. We don't have to beg God for his help. He's willing to help us. He's desiring to help us. He's already demonstrated his willingness and desire to help by sending his son to save us and sending the spirit to dwell within us. It isn't a you know, hope thing. or it's, it's a definite thing. We just need to come to God. He's not reluctant in helping us. God has shown you and I that he is for us and he's working all things together according to his purpose. He's shown us that. He's proved that through Christ. And we need to know that. Grab a hold of that. Instill it in our hearts. And live with it. And in it. Paul says, knowing that God is for us, you know, for who are his elect, then who shall bring a charge against us? You know, I mean, God's for me. Who's going to actually bring charges against me? Well, again, Satan does. Satan brings charges against us. In the book of Revelation, it says that Satan calls Satan the accuser of our brethren. And it says that he accuses us before God day and night. Day and night. He accuses us. So who's going to accuse us? Well, Satan Oh, and there's other people, too, who have accused us of things. They make charges against us. But God, who is for us, this is the important part. He doesn't bring charges against us. God does not bring charges against you. I don't know, I messed up pretty bad yesterday. He doesn't bring charges against us. In fact, he's justified us. He, he's cleansed us. You know, he's forgiven us. He's the one who has dropped all the charges against us because Jesus has paid the price for our sins. God has declared you and me innocent of all charges. He has brought no charges against us. We've been cleansed. So he's for us, but I feel this guilt and I feel this, this you know, shame. And, well, that's not on God. He's the one that's forgiven you so you don't have the guilt, so you don't have the shame. God is for us. He's not against us. You need to know that, that he's for us. Well, we can go on in our text and he says, well, if, if God doesn't bring charges against us, then who's condemning us? One guess. Yeah, that's Satan. Yes, Satan condemns us. And people condemn us. We condemn ourselves, do we not? We often are so hard on ourselves that we heap condemnation on ourselves. But God doesn't. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world to save it. John three seventeen to 18 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. We're not condemned. In fact, Jesus not only doesn't condemn us, he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us when we mess up. 1 John 2, 1 says, my little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. John, you know, listen, we need, you know, I, I don't want you to sin. I don't want to sin. So I'm, I'm writing these things about walking in God and a relationship with God so that you don't sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When accusations come against us, when condemnation comes against us, it's Jesus who stands up and says, I object. He's one of mine. And he, he steps forward on our behalf and he represents us and he speaks out in our favor in our defense. He defends us. He doesn't condemn us. He stands up and objects and defends us. He's one of mine. I've forgiven him. I've cleansed him. Well, the accusation is that he's done this, this, and this, and this. Yeah, but he was, 
he was beside himself, Father. All right? He was going through a few things. And I've forgiven him of all that and cleansed him of all that. So he's, he sits here innocent in your very presence. I've got him covered. He objects and he stands up and defends. He speaks in our favor. So it's not that he just doesn't condemn us. He defends us. In my house, we have a saying, and, and Jeanette's notorious for it, uh, where we always say that she puts on her tights for people. Superhero. Superheroes always wear tights, do they not? And so if somebody's struggling with something and going through something, we're going, hey, and we're kind of condemning them. Jenna will go, hey, and she'll interrupt and defend, and also you're putting on your tights for them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and she puts on her tights for everybody. Jesus puts on his tights for us, folks. He defends us. Are there truths? Yeah. Did I mess up? Sure. But he defends us. When Jeanette puts on her, tent, her, her tights for me, it's not because I'm innocent. It's because she's defending me. I love him. He's my husband. I, you know, we're married. She, she, you know, and this is what Jesus does. God is for us. He is not. Folks, he is not against us. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. So, Knowing God is for us, knowing that God does not bring any charges against us, knowing that God does not condemn us, then should we even worry about being separated from God? Is there anybody trying to separate us from God? Look at our text, verse 35 in Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. For as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long, and we, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Paul put in everything he could think of to encourage us here. Nothing, there is nothing that is able to separate us from the love of God. Well, I don't know, Pastor, I've messed up pretty bad. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Well, you know what, I, I'm tired, it just seems like I can't, I can't catch a break here, just thing after thing after thing after thing after thing after thing after thing keeps happening, I can't catch a break. Nothing can separate us. Persecution, famine means, you know, financial wrecks, nakedness and shame, perils, sword, persecution, distress, just ready to pull your hair out. Nothing can separate us. Paul asked this question, and, and this is, let, let me run the, you know, who can separate us from the love of God? Let me put it all into context. Knowing that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and that he works all things together for good to those that love God, and that God has predestined and called and justified us, and knowing that God is for us, not against us, and that he's not bringing charges against us. In fact, he justifies us. Knowing that he doesn't condemn us, but rather Christ actually intercedes with, for us. Knowing all of this, then what could possibly separate you from the love of God? Look what he's done to get us into his presence. Look what he is doing to, to keep us in his presence. With that truth grabbed a hold of is where he presents this question. Then what can separate you? Discouraging times, frustrating times, Tribulation, accusations against you, 
people who are mean to you, a loss of job, a sickness, what can separate you? And he says, nothing. There is nothing that will separate you from the love of God. Wow, nothing can separate you from the love of God. But we do know, why does Satan you know, come against us? Why does he bring charges against us? Why does he condemn us? He's trying to separate us from the love of God. He's trying to challenge the very promises of God, just like he did with Adam and Eve. Are you allowed to eat everything? Well, everything but that tree. Well, what happens if you eat that tree? If we eat that tree, we'll die. Oh, you won't die. Really? No, 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 no. You'll just be as smart as God. Huh. That would be cool to be as smart as God, wouldn't it? He does the same thing to us. We're going through something. Why is this happening? Because he doesn't love you. I mean, he loves so-and-so, but... You're always messed it up. He doesn't love you like he loves so-and-so. You know, he's tired of it. He has forgiven you and forgiven you and forgiven you and forgiven you. And you keep doing it. Yeah, no, he's done. He's done. He's finished with you. It's just to say, he's going, "Ah, here's Jim again saying the same thing. And why is he saying that? Why is he condemning me? Why is he bringing charges against me? He wants to separate me. Away from the love of God. And and Paul says, know this, nothing, nothing. And he gave quite a detailed list. None of this stuff. Not death, nor life, not angels, not principalities, nor powers, things present, things in the future, heights, depths, created things, nothing, nothing. Nothing. So we should all have the same heart and statement that Paul has there in verses 38 and 9. Knowing this, knowing that God is for us, not against us. Knowing that God is all all powerful and all knowing. Knowing that God does not condemn us and God does not bring charges against us. Knowing all that, then we should have this heart. Then I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us, or me, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's his point. Do you see where you are in God? Do you see where you are in Christ? God's love is constant. It remains constant. He doesn't love you and me because we deserve his love. He loves us because he loves us. He loves us for better or for worse. He loves us in rich, for richer or for poor. He loves us in sickness and in health. All of you have married have heard that before. And you said, I do to it. Why? Because if you didn't, they wouldn't marry you. Right? I mean, if, if you stood up there with the pastor and the pastor says, Jim, do you take Jeanette to be your lawful wedded wife? Do you promise to love and to cherish and, and, and to always be with her and that, and that you'll love her in, in sickness and in health and, and for better and for worse and, and for richer, for poor? And if I go, hmm, bit much, don't think so. Then he'd go, close the book and go, okay, we're done here, no marriage. So we commit to it. But God actually loves us this much, you guys. He actually loves us this much. And this is Paul's point. His love is constant. It remains always. Even when we mess up. He doesn't want us to mess up. He, John says, I, I'm writing to you so you don't mess up. There should be that heart of, I don't want to mess up. Some people walk around in their Christianity going, thank God for grace, I can do anything I want. And he don't care. Oh no, he cares. And he wants us to have the heart of, I don't want to mess up. If I'm loved this much by God, I love God that much. Oh, I try to. I can't compare my love to God's love. 
But the heart of a Christian is, is to see the love that God has for you. And that's what grabs our heart. And that's what moves and motivates us. And that's what we focus on when we look at sin and we go, ooh, that looks interesting. The next thought should be, but you know what? God loves me so much and he's warned me. He says, Jim, you go down that road, it's going to mess you up. It's going to mess you up. Yeah, but I'm forgiven, right? 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 Oh, grace, right? Right? It's going to mess you up. Don't go down that road. And if I do, oh, I'll pick you up. I'll love you. But it's going to be tough. You're going to hurt people. People are going to hurt you. The enemy is going to come against you and use all this stuff against you. Even 10 years from now, he's going to bring that up. I'm going to say, remember when? Yeah, well, God forgive me. Did he? Yeah. Are you sure? Pretty sure. I don't know, man. Because didn't you do it again? Yeah, but I repented. And he goes, you're going to give him all of that. And he's going to, it's like handing weapons to our enemy. Here, use this. Okay. Hit me with this one. Hit me with that. Ooh, here's a really good one. Smack me with this one, man. And it's like God saying, Paul is sharing with him, why would you want to do that? God loves you. He is for you. Yeah, we stumble and make some mistakes, and he picks us up. But don't go running down the road as if, hallelujah, I have grace, which we do. Run down the road with, Lord, I want to be pleasing. I want to enjoy the life that you have planned for me because your plans are good. Your end results for my life are good. All that unfolds in my life and everybody is all pointed towards good. You don't have anything, you don't hold things against me. Pursue God. Don't let anyone or anything keep you from God's love. I've seen people run from the love of God because they're hurt. You don't know what they did to me. And what was done to them was horrible. Horrible. And so... Why would I want God when I was hurt like that? I know people who run from God because they're scared. I don't know what, what Christianity means. I, you know, I don't know how my family will accept me. I don't know how my friends will accept me. I don't know how my job will accept me. I, I don't know, it's scary. I don't know, man, it's, it's a change. I don't know, man, I don't know. And they don't embrace the Lord. I know people who run from the Lord's love because they're angry. He didn't do it right. He did it for so-and-so, but not for me. Or why do you take this? Or why do you take that? And they're angry. I'm not going to go with love. And they're angry at him. I know people who have run from God because they're embarrassed. I, I don't even like to think about what I've done, let alone face God and tell him what I've done. And it's like, well, he already knows. Yeah, but to talk about it, it's like really, I, I, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to go. Some people run from God because they're full of guilt. I've gone too far. Oh, there's, there, there isn't a, a depth that God won't go to save you. Oh, no, I found it. I've done some really bad, horrible, bad things. So they run from God because it's just, I don't deserve like any of us do. I know of people who have run from God's love full of pride. I don't need God. Do you see how successful I am? Do you see how smart I am? Do you see what I have? Do you see what I've accomplished? Do you see who I am? I don't need God. And they run from his love. But Paul's point here in verse 37 is, yet all these things, all of this attack, all of this hurt, all of this scariness, all of this anger, all of this embarrassment, all of this guilt, all of this pride, he, said, he says, yet in all of these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than a conqueror means that you already know you're a victor in the middle of the battle. It's like, I know how this ends up. I mean, isn't that more than a conqueror? It's not just, I beat him. No, as you're fighting, I'm going to win. And, you know, Satan is fighting a losing battle, folks. We're fighting a winning battle. We're more than conquerors. And so Paul's point there in verse 37 is, yet in, in all of this, 
and all of this accusations and all this opposition and all these things that we face and all these sins and all these mistakes and all these stumbles and all these fears and all of these emotions. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So folks, always run to God. Always run to God. Always allow him to embrace you. Always allow him to comfort you. Always allow him to guide you. Always allow him to strengthen you. Always allow him to love on you because he is for you. Father, thank you for this opportunity of opening your word, Father, and, and just reading what you think of us and how you love us. Oh, Lord, we are beaten and even beat ourselves that we just think, ah, not me, I'm not worthy, but you love us. Father, may that be the very thing that grabs our hearts. You've demonstrated your love and your, your desire and your care for us by delivering Jesus to die for our sins and then sending the Spirit of God to dwell within us, to lead our steps and to enable us. You've promised us that you're not bringing charges against us anymore. You do not condemn us. Jesus defends us. He objects to the condemnation of the enemy and of the world. Father, may we, as we worship you now, allow this to just grab a hold of our hearts and our lives. May it just go so far deeper into our lives than just our, our knowledge. May it sink into our hearts and our lives. May it move us. May it stir us. Father, may it shake us, Lord. Our God loves us. He is for us. He has gone before us and will go before us in all things. He will watch over us in everything, in all that we go through. He'll bring us into good. It'll always end up in good in your presence, Father. So, Lord, as we worship you, Lord, may we allow ourselves to block all of our needs and situations and circumstances of the day aside and may we just sit at your feet and be in awe of your love for us and our relationship with you bless this time father as we worship you lord we do lift up our offering as a part of our worship and ask for your blessings upon it we do pray that you will prepare our hearts as we take communion together because it is through the sacrifice of jesus that we have this amazing relationship with you so we remember, bless this time as we worship you now in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.